what the Hall of Fame does is it brings out these hidden gems of technology that arose from the space program and now have done so much in our lives. Well, look at the size of computers. Gosh, 40 years ago, a computer was gigantic and it took up a whole room. And now I can do more with my tiny smartphone than that computer could do. It's 1994. The Japanese government and others make great strides in supercomputing speed and power. The U.S. is worried about falling behind. NASA Goddard is one of the groups tasked with finding a solution. Thomas Sterling and James Fisher have a novel idea. Develop supercomputing speeds by networking clusters of off-the-shelf computers together with fast communication software. Many said it couldn't be done. Big, expensive supercomputers are the only way to go. But Sterling, Fisher, and their team persist. Goddard has experience handling the large amount of data pouring up and down from satellites and expertise in parallel processing. Their experiments generate processing speeds faster than most supercomputer systems used for complex processing at a fraction of the cost. They call it the Beowulf Cluster. It uses inexpensive computer systems to perform parallel processing and runs on a new open source operating system called Linux. The Goddard Group refines their idea, sharing their approach with other programmers and scientists. Soon, several groups are improving the process. By 1996, a Beowulf cluster system is outperforming the gigaflop performance of million-dollar supercomputers. And in 1997, the Goddard Group is awarded the prestigious Gordon Bell Prize for outstanding achievement in high-performance computing. NASA publishes their results and even a guide to building your own Beowulf system. By 1998, anyone could purchase a pre-configured Beowulf type system. Companies like Penguin Computing continue refining and expanding the impact of cluster computing power, especially for critical infrastructures such as U.S. nuclear laboratories whose computers calculate seven quadrillion operations per second. Today, Beowulf-style clusters are in use everywhere. Nearly every system on the world's top 500 list of supercomputers use Beowulf methods and a Linux operating system. It's another example of engineering and innovation in space research powering information flow on Earth. Born from Canada's pioneering experiments in nuclear physics, Atomic Energy of Canada, a government laboratory, was charted with developing atomic power and understanding its hazards. They created the Can-Do Reactor design in the 1950s, built in Canada and dozens of other countries, and produced medical isotopes for use around the world. Atomic Energy of Canada researched the effects of ionizing radiation, and Dr. Harry Ng, a nuclear physicist at the laboratory, came up with a simple, reliable way to monitor a person's dose or the amount of radiation exposure. It was originally developed to detect potentially deadly exposure in the nuclear industry, and in later years made its way into space. Dr. Ng called it the bubble detector. We'll let Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield explain. These instruments are placed around various ISS modules, and each detector is filled with a clear polymer gel, inside which are liquid droplets. And when a neutron strikes the test tube, a droplet may be vaporized. This creates a visible gas bubble in the polymer. Each bubble, which represents uh, neutron radiation, is then placed within an automatic reader and counted. The more bubbles, the more radiation exposure. Simple, reliable. The Canadian government lab sought to spin off the technology into the private sector. In 1988, Dr. Ng took up the challenge, left the lab, and formed what is today Bubble Technology Industries. Bubble detectors are used worldwide in hospitals, power facilities, manufacturing facilities, submarines, and space. Radiation is much more intense in space than on Earth because our planet protects us from most of the radiation. 
The Canadian Space Agency has fostered the use of bubble detectors on Mir, Space Shuttle and ISS missions. Today, the expertise of bubble technology industries is in worldwide demand. Their products help monitor humans not only in hazardous situations, but help screen for exposure at public events, airports, medical offices, and disaster sites. Bubble detectors used on Earth and in space to help keep us safe. When engineering students at Stanford took one of Bob Twig's classes, they learned how to make satellites, small ones, roughly one half meter in diameter. It was hard work and students were challenged to get it all done in one semester. Bob reasoned that an even smaller satellite might make the coursework more manageable. Working with Jordi Puig Suari at Cal Poly, the two came up with the basic CubeSat design that would eventually become the worldwide standard. The development of the CubeSat prototypes was largely done by academic groups. Initially, NASA showed very little interest, nor was there much interest from industry. Real satellites were big, often the size of a Greyhound bus, and expensive, and many experts at the time said a tiny satellite was the dumbest idea they'd ever heard. But the CubeSat innovators continued their collaboration. The CubeSat idea succeeded for three main reasons. First, they were built from mostly inexpensive off-the-shelf components, not custom-built hardware. Second, they were built to a standardized design and form factor, the CubeSat unit. And third, because they were small and standardized, multiple CubeSats could be launched and deployed together using an ingenious P-Pod launcher to shoot the satellites out and away from the launch vehicle. In 2003, the first CubeSat was launched successfully from a Russian rocket. Once the concept had been proven to work, NASA and others were then willing to make room for CubeSats on orbital missions. Almost anyone could build and deploy their own satellite and test new ideas with very low risk. The universal acceptance of the Peapod launching concept was what led to the rapid growth of CubeSats. Advances in electronics design and manufacturing put even more capabilities within the CubeSat form factor. The original one-unit CubeSat form, a 10-centimeter cube, could be expanded so that bigger satellites were possible. In 2006, the biological CubeSat group NASA Ames Center launched GeneSat-1 to conduct biological experiments in space, the first science mission for a CubeSat. The success of that mission led to wide acceptance within the science community and NASA. In 2018, the first interplanetary use of a CubeSat came out of NASA JPL as part of the Mars InSight mission. Two six-unit CubeSats served as communication relays for the lander as it landed on the planet's surface. Two commercial companies, Planet Labs and Spire Global, now have constellations of hundreds of CubeSats that they use to capture high-resolution imagery and Earth observation data used by business, academic, and government customers around the globe. And it all started with a teaching tool about the size of a Beanie Baby box that opened our eyes to the stars. At Space Foundation, we advocate for innovation to better life on Earth. Space Foundation is proud to induct three new technologies and the individuals and organizations behind them into the Space Technology Hall of Fame. Beowulf Computing Cluster. Bubble Detector. CubeSats. The Space Technology Hall of Fame, tonight celebrating 35 years of inspiration, innovation, and imagination that makes life better here on Earth.
It's not just putting people into space or, or things into space. It's basic research that can be used to better humanity forever. Thank you.